Hello! Long time no talk. Welcome back to my channel. I read seven books. I read seven books in the month of February. <laughs> All of them were good. None of them I rated under three stars. Even the book that I rated three stars I would still recommend, just with some caveats. All of the books I read were by Black authors with Black main characters. All of them also American authors, because February is Black History Month in the US. This is my stack of physical copies. I did read two books on ebook. These books were from kind of a partial TBR that I had, the ones that I owned I obviously wanted to make sure I got to, as well as ones that I knew that I wanted to read for a while or that I had holds coming up for from the library. This is my first full like wrap-up video on this channel, so I'm super excited to get into all of these books and how much I enjoyed them. If you're new here, welcome. If not, welcome back. My name is Nick. I'm an avid reader and writer. I'm also a therapist in the state of California, and this is my channel where I talk books. We are going to go through the books I read this month vaguely in chronological order, which does actually mean I have to tell you I have something to admit. One of the books that I have in my stack I did not actually read in February. I read it in the very beginning of January, but I had to withhold my review because of the HarperCollins strike. So now that HarperCollins has settled with their union and a fair contract has been agreed upon, I can talk about this book that I love so much and have not stopped recommending since I read it. This is The Woman Could Fly by Megan Giddings. I think it is a cross between literary and than maybe fantasy or speculative fiction. It is written in a decidedly literary style, and I would say that is its dominant genre. There's a lot of magic happening. This is a book about witchcraft. This is a book about outsiderness and oppression and systems. This is a book about womanhood and feeling like there are no recourses for independence and true freedom and love. In this book, we follow our protagonist Jo, short for Josephine, as she tries to make sense of her mother's disappearance, as well as as she approaches her 30th birthday, try and figure out what she's going to do because if she's not married to a man by then, she is going to be subject to quarterly testing to see if she's a witch. In the world of this story, witchcraft is technically known, though not everyone has like experienced and seen it or fully believes in it necessarily. It is a very interesting cross between like bedtime story you tell your kids to get them to behave and very real and almost normal thing that is experienced. There are registered witches, some of them are artists, Josephine works in a museum, so she liaises with a few of them. And witchcraft and magic are essentially tools of the oppression of women, people of marginalized genders, and people with marginalized identities just in general. Jo's mother is black and her father is white, and so she is biracial, um, she is not necessarily white passing, and so that's something that impacts her a lot in her life as well. Jo is queer. This is a queer novel. It is not a queer romance story. I would not go into this expecting a love story, um, but it is queer in a lot of ways, and I think not only queer in terms of like literal attraction and queer attraction, but also just queer in terms of like the idea of queer time, the idea that queer people do not necessarily move through the stages of life in the exact same expected order that heteropatriarchy would impose upon us. It is gorgeously written. I will not rest until everyone I know has read it. I <laughs> just this last month made three of my friends read it and all of them really liked it, so I personally am feeling lucky in that regard and I'm recommending it to you as well. Join me, you're my friend now, and you should read this book. <laughs> It's just so interesting. I, like, I feel like I should move on to the next one because I didn't even read this in February, but I have so much to say about it. I just think it is an exceptionally written novel. I think it has so much to say about the human condition. It has so much to say about freedom and independence. It has so much to say about like what you do with the whole of yourself when people don't want to accept it. What do you do when you're beholden to someone? And the only way that you feel like you can find love is by letting yourself be beholden to them? And then what does it also mean to break out of the boxes that you thought were there for your own protection? Check your content warnings. I'm going to say that for all of these books. Um, this one in particular, there is some violence, and the violence is very specifically targeted against Joe's marginalized identities, so just know that. It's got a wide open ending that I thought totally served the story, so a weird book, not a super long book. It's like 300 pages, if that. I got through it really quickly, and absolutely one that you should consider picking up. My actual first read of February was This Poison Heart by Kaylin Bayron. This is a YA novel. It is YA fantasy. Uh, our protagonist here is named Brie. She is not our only Brie protag of the month. Um, her name is short for Brie Sace. 
I hope I'm saying that right. It's Greek. There's a lot of Greek mythology happening in here. Brie is a plant magician. That's not what it's called in this book. <laughs> Brie can do plant magic. She can grow plants. Uh, she's also immune to their poison. <laughs> this poison heart. Uh, the title I would say is pretty on the nose. I really enjoyed this. I got through it super fast. Again, it's not super long. This one is a little over 300 pages, but I got through her quickly. I really liked this. I read both this book and This Wicked Fate, which is the sequel. I don't have that one on me. I read it as an ebook. Um, both of them I liked a lot. I thought this was a very tight, like neat duology. I liked how much it had to say about friendship. It is also queer. I was not a fan of the queer love story. <laughs> <laughs> in this, um, I'm always gonna probably not enjoy the like very old mythological being falls in love with the teenager. I understand the way that this author tried to make it work. I also understand that it's a convention of the genre. So this is just a me thing, not really enjoying that. Um, I had a hard time rooting for the pairing in this, but I think that's fine. This book was so full of women. I feel like that was something that really stood out to me as I was reading. And like, they're all black women in this story. And I think there's something so cool about seeing this like matriarchal family structure and the power that runs through them and the magic and the storytelling and the sharing. Brie has two moms she is adopted and she also connects with her birth family and all of them kind of are intermingling and communicating with each other and trying to do what's best for Brie. She is hot-headed. She is also fairly reasonable as a teenager. I made a TikTok specifically talking about how this felt like such a normal parents daughter relationship in the sense that they are really trying to look out for her and protect her she is not hiding that much from them until the point at which she really is but she is not intentionally like oh i'm mad at my parents or i'm bored or i'm doing subterfuge like she gets caught up in stuff that's bigger than her but i think it felt very realistic that there are times where she does not expect herself to fight her own battles necessarily she reaches out to help from both of her parents which is beautiful i loved that the second book is a lot about grief the first book is also about grief. Um, but the second book especially, I found that really interesting. That's a theme that I felt myself for some reason gravitating towards this month. Uh, very few of the mothers in any of the books that I'm going to talk about are alive during the course of the story, or a mom dies, or like... I don't want to spoil stuff about this book. There is definitely death perhaps not as much as you might expect for something that is kind of on the fantasy side and there's a lot of drama happening, but you know, YA tends to soften that. I just thought it was really interesting, this idea of like daughters or sons who are mourning their mothers being a huge theme this month. It really stood out to me and it is something I'm thinking about quite a lot. I always enjoy stories about grief and loss. I find them very powerful. I think a lot of them are really about love at their core. I find them not directly relatable in the sense that I have lost someone very close to me, but I think relatable in the sense that we are all people and that is a facet of being a human being and we know people who have lost folks who are close to us, some of us have lost them ourselves, and it's coming down the line and I think that's something that's really scary to a degree but I find solace in stories like this where we really get to lean in and experience that with the character and kind of this safe container of the fiction. So yeah, I liked this book a lot. I liked the sequel. I think they were both pretty solidly in the three and a half to four and a half star range. So an average of four stars. I would totally recommend them, especially if you're looking for something quick. I read the second book on my phone as an ebook in like less than three hours. So if that tells you, they're fast. Uh, and especially once I think you get through the first one, you're like, oh my gosh, I want to see what happens next. So love that. I love a duology. Oh, it's so nice. I am so resistant to starting long fantasy series. Like if it's past a trilogy, you are going to have a hard time getting me to pick it up. <laughs> so shout out to duologies and shout out to Kaylin Bayron for this great book. The next book was technically my third book. I finished it in between finishing This Poison Heart and This Wicked Fate. I listened to it on audiobook, so I'll just throw up an image for you. Um, I listened to Black Girl Call Home Poems by Jasmine Manns. So this is a long poetry collection. It's like over 200 pages. I think it was over two hours on audio. It was longer than I was expecting, I think because I wasn't holding it. I was just listening to it. It is narrated by Manns, who is a spoken word poet, and you can feel it. She she is a very, very strong narrator and has a very clear voice. She knows how she wants these poems to be read and heard and understood, and so I appreciated that. I thought it was super well done in that regard. This was my lowest rated book of the month, and I still have really mixed feelings about that. I give it somewhere between three and three and a half stars. I am both a poetry snob and also someone who is very hesitant to critique things where the cultural aspects are just outside of my lane. 
A lot of these poems are about racism, a lot of them are about sexism and homophobia, but particularly about how those methods of oppression intersect with racism in the United States. The poems that were very effective I really loved. There's a poem where Manns talks Mans is a narrator, I should say, but this collection, a lot of the poems do feel very autobiographical. Anyway, there's a poem in which the narrator is talking to her mother and specifically talking about her own experience of being a lesbian and being black and how that conversation with her mother was very complicated and very difficult. And when her mother said things that we might from the outside think are just like unacceptable, like this is a, you should cut off your mother. Mans is interpreting this and understanding it through her own cultural lens and saying, you know, she's scared for me. She's worried for me. And so we get this kind of really interesting back and forth interplay. I loved that. There are some poems that are directed towards public figures like Kanye West that were a hard sell for me initially. I think I struggle sometimes with pop culture in my fiction, but or my books in general, poetry, whatever. But I thought it really worked. It won me over. Uh, a pattern that I noticed was that the longest poems in this collection were by and large my favorites. Uh, the short poems, and there were a lot of them, many of which were just the title and then one line, many of them did not land for me. Part of that I think is the audio format. It's, I didn't get as much time to sit with them as I might have liked to because we're just moving on to the next one. At times it was almost difficult to differentiate where one poem started and ended and then the next one began because the title would be kind of like used as a line of the poem as well. So I was like, is this a four line poem? Was that two two line poems? A little bit hard to say at times. So that was something that I was mindful of. But a lot of them just didn't really ring anything inside of me. They felt kind of Rupi Kaur-esque and I don't say that super complimentarily. I'm sorry if you're a Rupi Kaur fan out there. I think that her poetry tends to be a bit contrived and there were elements of that like here is a sentence and I'm selling it to you as a poem but it's not actually doing any deeper internal work. I felt that a bit in this collection so. It was a book of hit or misses for me. That was why I gave it around the three star range. Really it was like a two star book and a four four and a half star book in the same book for me. So I would say my recommendation honestly is to yes pick this one up but pick it up as a physical copy and then kind of move through and see what speaks to you without being constrained the way I was by the audio format where I had to listen to it linearly in order and I had to get through a bunch of poems I wasn't really feeling to get to the ones that I was really feeling a lot. The next book I read was Wash Day Diaries by Jamila Rouser and Robin Smith. This is a graphic novel and you can see the cover here. It's super shiny. It is super cute. I read this book so fast I was actually bewildered. It's not long at all. The pages don't tend to have very much text really. Lots of art. I enjoyed looking at the art. Um, the art style is gorgeous. It's so fun. And really my main critique is that I wish it had been longer. <laughs> this book started out as a webcomic which I feel like you can really tell. The way that it's structured we basically have five longish chapters. Each chapter the first four follow one of our main characters on the cover here and then the fifth one has kind of all of them in a different story setting. None of the stories are directly related to one another. They all seem to be set at different time periods. It's hard to tell like what's chronological and what's not. They feel like separate vignettes. They do have the same characters in them. The focus just shifts. I think I found myself as someone who doesn't read a ton of graphic novels, as someone who really never reads web comics, as someone who reads a lot of like fiction. I found myself really wanting a more concrete through line between these stories. I wanted to feel more connected to them. I wanted them to feel more connected to one another. It wasn't that the characters were unrelatable. I think that's a really easy way for like white reviewers to scapegoat books that they didn't understand or couldn't be bothered to connect with. There was a lot in here that was very connecting and that was really beautiful and I don't have to relate 100% to enjoy a story and think that it's meaningful and valuable so. I just know that the way my brain works I tend to like storylines that feel a little bit more coherent than what we got in here. Um, I also just wanted so much more of it. I was so sad when it was over. Um, this was a project, yeah, that was pulled together from a webcomic. It seemed like they were given the opportunity to create a book with a lot of existing material and also adding in some new material. And the authors were used to creating kind of one-off comic chapters. I hope that they do more stuff together with these characters or others because I really liked it. Um, I'd like to thank my friend Maya for lending this to me. Actually not lending, giving this to me. Thank you Maya. Um, there are quite a few books on my physical TBR now that are from them so 
amazing. But yeah, this one was just so quick. I finished This Wicked Fate and then I blasted through this and was like, well, I have finished two full books in one day. They were both short. Totally, this is a total easy recommendation. It's a lot of fun. It's really great. I think most people would really enjoy this book and it is very highly rated on uh, the websites that I use, Goodreads and Storygraph. So yeah, wide appeal for sure. The next book I read this month was Real Life by Brandon Taylor. This one has been on my physical TBR for a while. Um, I bought it a year or two ago, maybe. I bought it for like a dollar or two at a Goodwill. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. We love thrifting books. I was delighted to see it. I had known that I wanted to read it. Um, I have like a vague third or fourth degree connection with this author, I think, so I'd heard of it um, for a while, aside from the fact that it was uh, shortlisted for the booker, etc. This is decidedly literary fiction. We are, we don't have any magic. We don't have any like fantasy elements, any of that. In this we follow Wallace, who is a PhD student in the Midwest. He is originally from Alabama. He currently is the only Black student in his PhD program, which is quite small, one of the only non-white students. Wallace is also gay, and this book follows primarily just his struggle with that. This is a very character-focused novel, and it's very, like, prose focused novel. It is such literary fiction. I was joking that like not a whole lot happens in this book and I still got through it very quickly. This one is also not super long. I did not read a ton of really chunky books this month, though look out for the next review I'm about to do because that one was chunky. At times we jump back and forth between flashbacks and present day. That is not something I ever mind. We do that in The Woman Could Fly too, and I think some reviewers might have found that a bit confusing, but I think that it was pretty followable if you're paying attention and you're willing to kind of roll with not always knowing exactly what is happening. Because these authors aren't necessarily going to spell it out for you and I kind of appreciate that. I thought the writing in this book was stunning. I thought that it was super super lyrical and beautiful and elevated without being totally overwrought or purple prosy. And I really loved Wallace as our protagonist. I think Wallace could have been someone who had a lot more figured out than he does. He could have been someone who really is like, I know what I'm worth and I know what I want to do and I, I'm not going to let anyone hold me back but at times like he lets stuff hold him back. Wallace is awkward. Wallace is nervous. Wallace is struggling. Wallace has trauma. And I think all of those things made him feel so real and such a great protagonist for this book. I thought the title was impeccable. This book really is not giving us like this fantastical version of things. Like I kept reminding myself as I was reading like this is real life because like you want the people who messed up his experiments to come to justice. You want the people who are saying garbage about him behind his back to end up having to confront the fact that they are doing garbage. But this is real life. Like it's really really interesting that you can be frustrated by what's happening and also totally understand why it's happening the way it is and why Wallace is acting the way that he is. There are content warnings here that I think are fairly intense, so just a heads up on that, particularly for childhood sexual assault, which we do see somewhat graphically, especially in memories about it on the page, and kind of like violence, a bit of sexual violence, messy consent stuff, that all shows up in here, so know that going into it if you're looking to read it. But I absolutely loved this book. This book and The Women Could Fly both are rated under four stars on Goodreads, at least when I last looked. I think that's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I gave them both five stars. Um, this book was a super easy five stars. I had a feeling it would be even before I finished it. And I was right. I loved it. I am someone who is really willing and eager to get entranced by beautiful writing. And I would read Brandon Taylor's grocery lists. I'm halfway through a short story by him right now as well about a 20 something year old who is given a prognosis basically and knows that she has only months left to live. And that one is also very grounded in reality and very much about her just trying to get by day to day, complicated family dynamics, making bad choices sometimes, not always able to experience like the very, very best that life has to offer because sometimes life doesn't give you that. So I love it. I think it's bleak. I think it could be depressing to read. <laughs> I don't mind that generally. Um, I really like the realism and the groundedness. So this was a nice respite from all of the fantasy, fantastical YA that I read this month. The last book I read this month, I technically finished today. I'm filming this on March 2nd, so I cheated a little bit, but this felt like a February book to me. I read the majority of it in February and I just want to talk about it right now. I don't want to wait. <laughs> this is Legendborn by Tracy Dion. Wow, you're probably wondering where the hell I've been. Of course I shouldn't have read this book already. <laughs> 
especially as someone who's like on book talk and has seen it recommended five trillion times i just usually am like fantasy is not my genre and then i read a bunch of fantasy this month and last month whatever i finished this about an hour ago and i loved it i loved it so much i thought it was so good i don't know that it's gonna net a full five stars for me um i think i need to sit with it for a little bit but it's four stars or higher for sure totally recommend it this is a ya novel set at a college our protagonist is 16 she's at an early college admission program her name is also brie we've got another brie in the house and she discovers that she has magic basically um, she doesn't know what to make of it she doesn't know what to do with it um, brie's mother dies before the beginning of this book uh, much like wallace from real life who loses both of his parents like brie from this poison heart um, who loses her biological mother and then i won't spoil other stuff but she has other losses in her life as well well. Much like Joe from The Woman Can Fly, who also loses her mother, this is another tale of mourning and of grief amidst a whole lot of other stuff going on. I really appreciated that Dion centered the grief in a lot of ways that I wouldn't necessarily expect a fantasy novel to do, so kudos for that. I thought it was super well done. I want to also really quickly mention Therapist Hat On that Dion in the author's note, as well as like in the text of this novel, mentions Persistent Complex Bereavement Disorder, PCMD, very recent addition to the DSM, new in the DSM-5, as one of the things that Brie struggles with in this book, and also one of the things that Dion herself has struggled with in the loss of her own mother. Fantastic. So good. I really appreciated that being brought up here. That's something that we are seeing more and more of, as there are more complicated situations around loss in our lives, especially at the start of the pandemic like it's difficult so I really respected that as well as the mention of like comorbid disorders it was really well done like if you're looking for a generally accurate and compassionate picture of grief and loss and moving on but not in a storybook perfect way in a way that you're making meaning of that loss and being able to keep yourself going without like letting go and never feeling sad again I wouldn't have expected to hear myself say that Legendborn is like the place to go for that, but I absolutely think that it could be. This book has a lot of Arthurian legend in it, which I thought was very cool in the author's note. Dion said that she was also challenging the idea of who gets to be legendary and what that actually looks like, especially in this modern era. Fantastic. This is such a fast-paced book. This book is, oh, 500 pages long. <laughs> <laughs> it took me a while to get through, but I was not bored for one second. This is the kind of book where I put it down and I was like, I miss reading Legendborn. I want to pick it up as soon as I can. I have stopped myself from exiting my home to go purchase the second book immediately because I needed to film this while there was still light. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm probably gonna do that. I think it's gonna be one of my March reads, even though I know that book is even longer. It's like almost 600 pages. I don't think it's gonna take me that long. This one took me like four days, and that was with other stuff happening in my life that I needed to be accomplishing. This was escapist. This was immersive. This was really well written. I feel like with YA and YA fantasy, but like YA is a genre in general, I don't necessarily expect good prose? That sounds mean. It's true. I don't expect the prose to like blow me away or sweep me off my feet, but there were lines in this book. I filmed a vlog on TikTok. I'll link that in my description, like a little reading vlog, and I read multiple lines out loud because I was kind of blown away by how much they were hitting me. One of them basically said why a person died and why a person is gone are not the same question. So good! Oh my god. Yeah, it hit me. It hit me hard. Brie is fantastic as a protagonist. I think she's a really great choice for this story. I There is no one else that could have been our protagonist here, but I think the fact that she has a temper, the fact that she is impatient and impulsive, she also feels mature. She also feels grounded. She has a really interesting relationship with her dad, with her best friend. This is the time of life for a lot of people. Brie is 16, right? But that transition to college, that transition out of the home is such a challenging time. And it's such a time where people are trying to form their identities and figure out who the heck they are without, you know, the childhood that you've held on to for your whole life. And so this was a really great coming of age story, but also coming into different like societies, coming into different stages of life, coming into different experiences. There's a very fun and interesting like kind of a love triangle in this book. Not quite. I imagine that it's going to ramp up a lot in the second book and eventually the third. This is a trilogy. I did not know that. I thought it was a duology. I got tricked. <laughs> That's okay. I'm not mad about it actually. <laughs> I'm excited to get more in this world, but I loved it. I thought it was super, super well executed. My brain is 
spinning because I just finished this, so forgive me if I'm a little all over the place. I'm also really interested because I'm about to read Babel by R.F. Kuang, and I'm interested about how this book is in conversation with real life when we're talking about academia and racism and oppression and people who are in really interesting positions within those structures. Babel, I'm sure, has a lot to say about that too. The Woman Could Fly has something to say about that. I also think The Traitor Baru Cormorant, which I read in January, has a lot to say about systems and oppression and villainy and the fact that the structure is the thing doing harm and that means that there is no big bad to kill and then it's all over and everything is better, which is so bleak and upsetting and also very real and I think while the Traitor Baru Cormorant as like adult dark historical fantasy is quite different from this book and real life and The Woman Could Fly, I imagine different from Babel as well, I still think that all of these books have a lot to say to one another. And so I really appreciated getting to read a lot of different books across different genres that still all have these through lines of having a lot to say about grief, having a lot to say about like parent-child relationships, having a lot to say about structures and structural oppression. It's all interesting and it is percolating in the back of my head. I'm sure I'll have an actual video in me about that at some point but I have just appreciated the ride that all of these books have taken me on. So that's my stack, <laughs> as you can see. I had a great reading month. I don't know, I just enjoyed it so much. I had a lot of fun reading all of these books. There were definitely... I had aspirations to read more, but seven books in one month is a lot for me. Even if one is a short graphic novel and one is a book of poetry, I often have a lot going on in my life. I had less happening in February. I'm going to be ramping up back again in March. But it's really cool to be able to immerse myself in these books, enjoy them, have a lot to say about them, have a lot to say about their relationships with one another, and feel excited to keep going. I don't feel burned out. I think that's one thing I think about too when I'm trying to figure out how many books I want to read in a month or in a year. I don't want to burn myself out. I want to have fun. I want to be excited to pick up the next book. Currently Babel is next on my list. We're gonna see if that's the next one or if I go pick up Bloodmarked. It's still light out. <laughs> I'm tempted to just run down to the store. <laughs> Either way that I'm excited to read Babel and um, finally hear what all of the hype has been about because oh my goodness I've heard so many things, some conflicting with one another about this book. It is my next book club pick so I'm excited not only to read it, it's a brick, but also to then get to discuss it with my friends who I know are also going to have a lot to say about it. Just because I finished this challenge for February absolutely does not mean that I am going to stop reading a diverse selection of books and particularly books by Black authors. So you can look out for more of that from me soon. I have more challenges coming up on this channel so stay tuned for that as well. For the time being though that's what I have for you today y'all. I hope you have a beautiful rest of your day. Thank you so much for tuning in. As always like, subscribe, comment, share. All of it helps me a lot, especially as someone who's just starting out on booktube. And yeah, take care. I'll see you in the next one.